Okay, cool. Okay, so uh, now we are going to move to the second talk, which is about unconstrained variable oracles for faster static analysis by Vincenzo Arceri, Greta Dolcetti, and Enea Zafanella. So, and uh, Greta is going to give the talk. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm Greta Dolcetti from Kafoska University of Venice, and today I'm going to present to you unconstrained variable oracles for faster numeric static analysis, which is a joint work with Vincenzo Arceri and Enea Zafanella, both from University of Parma. So we are in the context of static analysis by abstract interpretation. And as we know, the abstract interpretation process may suffer some inefficiencies. There are many ways to tackle these inefficiencies. Some canonical solution, for example, are choosing a different abstract domain. So we can go, for example, from polyhedra to the octagon domain, being more fast, faster but losing some precision. Or we can choose different implementation of abstract operators inside our domain of choice to be more efficient. Another technique is abstract compilation, whereas for abstract compilation, we intend a set of techniques that consist of the rewriting the intermediate program representation adopted the analyzer. In this case, the goal is to optimize the abstract execution, and we are in a context where there's a trade-off between accuracy and efficiency. So we are targeting efficiency, and we are okay with losing some uh, accuracy wherever it happens. We know that traditionally efficiency of the evaluation process may be improved by propagating known information. Our goal here in this work is to show that these improvements may also be achieved by propagating unknown information. To explain that, I have to introduce the concept of likely unconstrained variables, and I want to do that with a simple example. So let's suppose we are doing a sort of analysis of with intervals, and after some analysis steps, we have information about these two variables, expression, which is bounded by 1 and 12, and y, which is unbounded. We know nothing about y. Then let's suppose that we want to analyze this assignment, which is x is equal to y plus expression. And the end, after the analysis of this assignment, what we have is that we have the same information about expression and y. And for x, we do not have any information. In this context, y is like unconstrained, so therefore x is like unconstrained too. So if no information is known about y, then it's likely that little to no information will be known about the whole expression that contains y. So there is little to no incentive in providing an accurate and maybe expensive evaluation of the old expression that contains a variable which is likely unconstrained. The idea here is to identify the variables that we will call likely unconstrained variables for which no information will likely be available at a given program point. And once we identify them, what we want to do is to propagate this lack of information throughout the old program. The goal, as I said, is to simplify the analysis and improving efficiency. In our work, we have three major steps. The first one is a data flow analysis, for which we have two variants. The first one is a relational variant, for to be used with relational domains such as polyhedra. The second one is a non-relational variant, for to be used with non-relational domains such as intervals. What they do is that basically they analyze a statement at the time, and after the analysis of that statement, they update the set of variables that are likely unconstrained after the execution of that statement. Then we have two kinds of propagation to propagate on the unknown information, and they are the existential propagation and the universal propagation. After that, once we have computed the information about the like and constraint variables, you have to apply the program transformation step to create the simplified version of the program, that, of the intermediate representation of the program that we are going to analyze. Here, as I said, we have four different variants, which are given by the combination of the two different oracles, relational and non-relational, and the two different kinds of propagation, existential and universal. These are heuristic solutions, so they are subject to both false positives and negatives. But the final analysis is always sound. I want to mention that we have four different variants because we are looking for an aggressive variant in order to tackle major efficiency improvement. Now let's look at the non-relational oracle and the formalization for the data flow analysis. So here we're analyzing for in the first example the uh, non-deterministic assignment. And what we do here, it's basically we add the uh, variable on the left-hand side of the non-deterministic assignment into the like and constraint set. 
for other assignment with two variables or one variable and one constant, what we do is that we uh, remove the variable from the like and constraint uh, set if we are able to say something about the right hand side of the assignment. So if both variables are not like and constraint or if we are doing some operation such as the um, subtraction from a variable by itself or multiplication by zero so that we can say something about the right hand side. In the same way, when we are analyzing Boolean guards, we remove one variable from the, the um, likelihood constraint set if the other one is not likelihood constraint. The relational oracles has a similar implementation, but as I said, it's thought to be used with relational domains, such polyhedra, so we're aiming to be more conservative. For the non-deterministic assignment, we have the same application, so uh, we simply add the likelihood constraint variable to the likelihood constraint set. And for the assignment, what we do is that we remove all the variables if you're using some specific operation, such as plus or minus. Otherwise, we adopt the uh, non-relational um, variant. And for the Boolean uh, guards, we simply remove all the variables the, from the likelihood constraint set. So, as I said, these uh, oracles are heuristics, so they are subject to false positives and negatives. Here, there's an example of false positives. So, let's suppose that this is the whole program that we are analyzing. The first statement is an assignment. Y is assigned uh, to zero, so it's not like a constraint since zero is a constant. Then, X is equal to Y times Z. But, since Z is likely and constraint, then X is like and constraint too even though the interval analysis would compute x as zero, because that's a multiplication by zero. Whereas for the false negatives, let's suppose that, as I said, this is the whole program that we are analyzing, and let's suppose that we have two Boolean guards. Y is greater or equal than zero, and Z is less or equal than zero. Then, uh, then we remove Y and Z from the like and constraint set when we are evaluating these Boolean guards. Then we have an assignment, x is equal to Y plus Z. X is considered constraint here, even though the interval analysis would compute minus infinite plus infinite. Looking at the propagation, as I said, we have two variant, two different propagation. We have the existential value propagation for which a variable is part of the like and constraint set at the beginning of a basic block if there's at least one incoming edge along which that variable is like and constraint. Dually, the universal propagation, a variable is part of the like and constraint set at the beginning of a basic block if that variable is like and constraint along all incoming edges on that basic block. Whereas for the program transformation step, as I said, this is the algorithm that rewrites our initial uh, intermediate representation of a program into a new intermediate representation, which we are later going to analyze. Here, we are working on the input CFG in the, the intermediate representation, and since this is executed after the data flow analysis, what we have is that we have the information about the variables in the CFG. So they are already mapped, and we know what variables are likely to be unconstrained. What we do here is that for each basic block, we compute and we retrieve the information about the variable that are likely to be unconstrained after the execution of that basic block. Then, for each statement, which is an assignment, we uh, check if the left-hand side of the assignment is likely to be unconstrained after the execution of that busy block. If that's the case, we simply replace the left-hand side of the assignment with the non-deterministic assignment. So we basically simplify that assignment. But let's see that in work with an example. Let's suppose that we are uh, analyzing this simple CFG with four basic blocks, B0, B1, B2, and B3. In this case, we are using a non-relational oracle with existential propagation. So at the beginning of the analysis, what we have is that all the variables are likely unconstrained. So X, Y, and Z are all likely unconstrained variables. Then we start with analyzing B0. We have an assignment, zero is equal to, X is equal to, to zero. Zero is a constant, therefore X is removed from the likelihood constraint set. So after the analysis of B0, the likelihood constraint set is made by Y and Z. Then we proceed with analyzing B1. So we have a Boolean guard, Y is less than zero, zero is a constant, Y is removed from the likelihood constraint set. Then we have two assignments, 
x is equal to x plus 1. Since x is likely unconstrained and 1 is a constant, we do not have to update the likely unconstrained set. y is therefore um, assigned to y plus 1, and for the same reason, y is not likely unconstrained and 1 is a constant. So at the end of execution of b1, we have that the likely unconstrained set is composed just by the variable z. Then we analyzed the basic block b2. For the same reason, we have a Boolean guard, y is greater or equal than zero, and since uh, zero is a constant, y is removed from the likely unconstrained set. Then we have the same assignment, x is equal to x minus one, and therefore x is not, in mo this assignment is not modified in the likely unconstrained set. But then here we have y is equal to z times two. Since z is likely unconstrained, then y is added back to the likely unconstrained set. So the resulting like a constant set after the execution of B2 is made by Y and Z. To compute the like and constraint set that holds before the, the uh, analysis of B3, we have to reason about which kind of propagation we are using. In this case, we are using the existential propagation. Therefore, the likely unconstrained set before the execution of B3 is made by the union of the likely unconstrained set computing in the two previous basic blocks. So it's composed by Y and Z. Then we are going to analyze the statement, which the assignment inside B3. This is X is equal to X plus Y. But since Y is in the likely unconstrained set, then X is added back to the likely unconstrained set. So therefore, after the execution of B3, we have that all variables are likely to be unconstrained. After we executed this data flow analysis, we had to apply, as I said, the program transformation step. So here, we have rewritten this um, CFG into a simplified one. And as we can see, we are rewriting two statements into non-deterministic assignment. The reason for that is that, as I said here, Y in the basic block B2, it's likely to be unconstrained after the execution of B2. So the, uh, the, the assignment Y is Z times two is rewritten into the non-deterministic assignment. And for the same reason, X is equal to X plus Y, since X is likely to be unconstrained after the execution of B3, is rewritten as the non-deterministic assignment. Here, we are analyzing the same CFG with the same non-relational oracle, but a different kind of universal propagation to highlight the differences. So what we have is that, of course, all the variables are likely to be unconstrained at the beginning of the analysis, and therefore then we have the same uh, result, the same like unconstrained for basic block B0, so it's made just by Y and Z, B1, just Z, and B2, Y and Z, because the analysis proceeds as before. But here, for basic block B3, once again, we have to reason about which kind of propagation we are using. In this case, the universal propagation. So here, the likely unconstrained set that holds before the execution of B3, it's, it's composed by the intersection of the two previously computed likely unconstrained set. So in this case, it's the intersection between Z and Y and Z, so it's composed just by Z. So here we proceed with the analysis of the basic block B3 with the assignment X is equal to X plus Y. Since now neither of that variable is likely to be unconstrained, we do not need to update the like unconstrained set so that at the end, after the execution of B3, just the variable Z is likely to be unconstrained. Then we proceed with the program transformation step. And here we can see that this time we are simplifying just one statement, just the statement in B2. The reason for that is, as before, what this left-hand side of this assignment, after the execution of B2, it's likely to be unconstrained. So we simplified it. But this time, if we are looking at B3, we were, once, uh, we were previously uh, simplifying. This time, X is not likely to be unconstrained after the execution of B3. So we are not simplifying that, resulting in a less aggressive simplification. For the experimental evaluation of this work, we adopted two benchmark suits. The first one is composed of 34 files distributed with an analyzer Pagai and used for the worst case execution time analysis. Since these files are very synthetic, we are not focusing on them now, and you can find the details on the paper. 
Here, we are focusing on 10 files distributed with SVCon without the implementation on 10 Linux drivers. And for our analysis, we adopted two domains, the interval domains and the factor polyhedra implemented in the PP Lite library. We implemented our analysis in two modules, CLAM and CRUB, which are modules of the CORN verification framework. CRUB is the C++ library for static analysis, which offers the implementation for many abstract domains and fixed point engine. It relies on its own intermediate representation, which is called CRUB IR, from which here you can see an example. This is an important example because this is exactly what we are working on. This is the CFG that we are going to rewrite. Also highlighted here, you can see Havoc, which is the, code, the statement inside the CRUB intermediate representation for the non-deterministic assignment. So this is what gives the name in the next step to our analysis. CLAM, instead, it's the front end for CRUB, and it basically takes an input the C source code, it transforms it LLVM bit code, and then it creates the CRUB intermediate representation. So it's creating the CFG for which we are working on in the next step. Another useful tool present in this framework is CLAM diff. So CLAM diff, it allows us to uh, compare the uh, invariants computed by two different analy analyses in a semantic way so that we can say which one is more precise. Basically here, what we have is that we have implemented two pipelines. The first one is the classical pipeline. So we start from the C source code that we are analyzing, then our actor clang and clam preprocessing step transform that into LLVM bit code so that then clam uh, creates the original crab CFG, the original crab in crab intermediate representation. Then we are doing the target analysis and what we obtain are the original target analysis invariant. On the other end, where we are applying our implementation, what we add is that we start with the C source code as well. We apply uh, and Clang and Clam preprocessing creates the LLVM bit code. Then Clam creates the original CRAB intermediate representation. Then we apply our data flow analysis, which is called AVOC analysis, from which we obtain the information about the unknown variables inside our CFG. After that, we, uh, we uh, we apply the program transformation step, which is called AVOC propagation, from which we obtain the AVOC CRUB IR, so the simplified version of our intermediate representation. Then we apply the same default target analysis on that simplified CLUB intermediate representation, from which we obtain the uh, AVOC target analysis invariant. Once we have computed the two invariants from the classical analysis and from the simplified analysis, we compare that with ClamDiff in order to see whereas there are uh, pre any precision losses. The first thing that we did was to uh, evaluate this statement in uh, our benchmark. We are, uh, here we are seeing the 10 Linux driver, and for each of them, you can see in the first column the name, then the number of statements, and then the four variants. And for each variant, they are reported uh, how many statements of the original statement are simplified, and the time expressed in milliseconds, from which it is taken for the data flow analysis and the program transformation step. What we can see here is that we have four different approach, and for the most aggressive one, so the no relational oracle with existential propagation, we are simplifying between 4.5% of the original statement and up to 82.1% of the original statement. Whereas in average, we are simplifying 33% of the original statement, so a lot. And uh, for the most conservative uh, oracles, which is the relational oracle with the universal propagation, we are simplifying between 0.2% of the original statement and 10.9% of the original statement, with an average of 4.1%, so much lower. So here we see that relational oracles are too conservative to luckily <laughs> bring any efficiency improvement, whereas non-relational oracles are rather aggressive, so they may trigger significant efficiency improvement. So for the evaluation, we are focusing on them. Also, what we can see is that relational and non-relational variant of the AVOC analysis seems to have a much greater impact than the choice between existential and universal propagation. 
for the precision analysis. Here we report the analysis with the interval domain, and we just report the two drivers for which we have a precision loss. What we can see here is that we have a precision loss uh, in about 4% of the invariant. But if you're looking at the constraint that made up the invariants, we were able to compute up to 99% of the original constraint. Of course, here we are not focusing on time since intervals are already very fast and it's difficult to see efficiency improvement. But for the polyhedra domain, what we have here is a representation for all the drivers. And what we can see is that, yeah, we do lose precision in about 50% of the time, but we are able to compute uh, circa 90% of the original constraint. And sometimes, usually, we are uh, less precise in an invariant, but just by one or two constraints. What we can see here is that usually existential and universal propagation behaves in the same way, whereas sometimes universal, it's, it's lighted there, it's, uh, more preci it's preciser. But also, we have some interesting cases for which we are analyzing the, the speed up later, for which we do not lose precision at all. So, talking about uh, uh, speed ups, here you can see in blue the original times for our test sorted by from the longest to the shortest time and expressed in seconds, while in uh, orange you can see the time or for the target analysis with our approach. I want to mention that the time expressed in all orange also includes the data flow analysis and the program transformation step. So as you can see here, the, we have, you, you usually have speed ups and it varies from long, long uh, programs to short programs with an average of 2.61. Another interesting thing to say is that the uh, time expressed in blue are computed and are similar to the times computed with the ELINA library, which is considered state of the art. So talking about the test that uh, had uh, no precision loss at all, we were able to measure that it has always a speed up of 1.60, which is interesting. And whereas for the most, the, the biggest speed up that we have, it's for a, a short test, but we have a speed up of 8.23%. And uh, also this happens for a, at the longest test, which uh, was evoking up to 80, uh, circa 80% of his statement. And we have a speed up of 8.61, uh, 8.16, sorry. So concluding, in this work, we uh, obtain significant speed up, up to 8.23%, with an average of 2.61. And we suffered limited precision loss, because we were able to compute circa 90% of the original constraint. For future work, we are looking for Fortin simplification of the CFG after our AVOC processing, which is composed of the data flow analysis and the program uh, simplification step, and we are looking to improve heuristic either to improve efficiency furtherly or to, be, uh, to have a less precision loss. So in this work, we showed how to uh, propagate lack of information. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Greta. So we have uh, questions here. Does it work? Yes. It does. And thank you for your talk. So you mentioned that you have both false negatives and false positives. Do you have an intuition how often that actually happens? Mm, not really. Not uh, it's just uh, from the high level idea. It's it from the high level, yeah. The high level, it's an heuristic. We have uh, um, no precision uh, requirement. No, sorry, no correctness requirement. So this is implemented as a heuristic. The, we know this is subject to both for positives and negatives, but at the moment we didn't do any statistics about how often this happens. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Jérôme. Thank you, I have two questions if I may. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you for your talk, it's very interesting. My first question is, a common source for uh, having uh, unconstrained variables is loops when you are unable to uh, find an inductive invariance. Do you have uh, ideas to uh, extend your work to, to deal with this fact? 
Uh, at the moment, no. This is just a lightweight pre-analysis, which is a, a, compu a computation of a fixed point on the CFG. Uh, what we can say is that the analysis always terminates, and we are happy with that because we are working, of course, on two finite lattices and uh, with a monotonic function. But at the moment, we do not focus on uh, loops. My second question is um, about the fact that you transform assignment. Have you considered other approach, like, uh, for instance, um, guiding partitioning to, uh, to be precise for the control flow class when you, have, uh, when you know that uh, variables are constraints and to be very imprecise on uh, other uh, control flow paths? Okay, no, at the moment we didn't consider that, but that's interesting. So, yeah, of course, the idea is to target the, uh, the statement that are uh, useful to say something about the variables, so to, um, to, um, to infer some properties about the variables. So, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So, thank you for the talk. I guess, yes, okay. So I guess the analysis as you presented this seems to be intra-procedural. Yeah. Did you think about making it inter-procedural or not? At the moment, no, because uh, the tool in which we implemented the analysis uh, has the inter-procedural inter mode, but it may suffer some precision losses. But what we did was inlining the function in order to, uh, to be more precise. Okay, thanks. Well, uh, I, I will also uh, ask one question. So when you talked about false negatives, you, uh, you did show an example, and I was wondering whether this could be solved with a slightly finer grain notion of uh, likely unbounded, where you would distinguish likely unbounded by below and by above. Did you look into fire, finer grained uh, likely unbounded constraints, or did it just? No, this is just the, the implementation. We did not go into finer um, conception of uh, likely unconstrained, but for um, Do you it, think it, it would make sense? Yeah, it may, may have sense. Of course, uh, the more you are able to distinguish between like and constraint and, like, and not like and constraint, the, more, the less precision you are losing at the end, I think. One more, uh, Jérôme. I think that's quick. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, that's a bit specific, but about Chrome diff, I was wondering how the, uh, the difference of precision was measured. Is it like a percentage of uh, missed... Um, uh, assertions like a uh, missed um, properties proved? Yeah. No, just uh, focusing on invariance computed and what the ClamDs does is for each um, program point it does, it, it compares the invariance computed by the two different analyses semantically and then it outputs whether they are different and, uh, and we then check uh, how different they were. But uh, <coughs> since the, one of the benchmark wasn't um, annotated for like uh, assumption, we just worked on the invariants. Then, of course, the invariants we are uh, computing may be used for a, a certain uh, assumption. Okay, so that's a kind of volume uh, of uh, error uh, that was missed, uh, that, uh, precision that was missed. Yeah, the precision is computed on the invariance, and then we looked at the number of constraints in the invariance to whether to see how far we are from the original invariance. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Andy? Um, have, you ever, have, you, have you any thoughts on how this might carry over to octagons? Because they're, they're, because they're quite interesting. Because like small octagons, when the degree of the octagons is relatively small, work great. But once you're working with large numbers of variables, there are real memory performance there, partly because of issues such as caching, uh, such, as, um, 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 uh, such, as, such as accessing these big uh, uh, arrays. Um, so, so if you could detect that a variable was not required, you could then reduce the dimensionality of your octagon, and that might give a big performance win and be something perhaps between the, the, the amount of pruning you get with, with um, intervals and the less aggressive pruning that you get with polyhedra. Have you any thoughts on that? That could be the case. Yeah, um, I think that the more uh, expensive and the more precise the domain is, the more uh, benefit you can get from this kind of approach and pre-analysis. Okay, That's cool. It. 
Okay, um, maybe we have, no, I don't think we have time for a uh, last question. I think we had a long discussion, so uh, thanks a lot for the very nice presentation. <laughs> for going.